Great. Okay, this is Dan Kittredge um, here for the second uh, iteration of our, our deep science conversation, everything that we've been doing to the BFA. We've got Greg Ostick here to uh, jump in. I'll do a um, five, 10, 15 minute overview and, and uh, justification. And then Greg will, as we did last time, jump into more of the, um, the details. So we'll just, we'll just jump in here. Um, we've got a, a, a big announcement, um, which we're, we're as, as, is our, as is our way, uh, <laughs> releasing gently. Um, uh, formally, as of, as of a couple of days ago, we have a, um, a new website established called, it's a bionutrientinstitute.org. Um, we're pivoting all of the work that we've been doing um, on the science side with the Real Food Campaign into the Bionutrient Institute. And then we're gonna be uh, keeping the Real Food Campaign as, a, as a, a frame to be engaging the broader community and audience. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, about that work, um, what, where we're at with the Institute and some of the exciting things that have allowed us to get to that. But, but first, um, just the broad introduction of what we're doing with this nutrient density project with the bionutrient meter, with soil testing, with nutrient variation, with the open source data framing, why we've done what we've done. Um, you know, this question of nutrient density that I think, you know, the BFA has been fairly um, at the front of the conversation about um, is one that it seems to me in the past six months or maybe a year, uh, I, the sense I'm getting is that a lot of a lot of people are starting to come and put you know one and two and three together and, and maybe get six and say that the connection between soil health and human health, um, cultural health, environmental health, really you know food quality may be a, a beautiful sort of high ground where all these things can simply connect. Um, and one of the questions that I get is why has this not been done before? You know why do we not know what nutrient density is? Um, and so I'd like to sort of just go into that for a little while and talk about the complexities and, and, the, um, and the strategy that we've come up with. And then a little bit about the Institute and where we think we're going. And then um, Greg will, will, will jump into those, you know, more technical points. So, um, you know, it was about four years ago, I guess, maybe five. Um, I think it was actually almost five years ago in August of 2016. Uh, when the uh, staff of the BFA got together for a retreat and we'd been giving our two-day courses around the country for a few years and talking about nutrient density and talking about spectrometers and testing and this vision of, oh my God, wouldn't it be amazing if we could do this? Um, but it didn't seem like we had the capacity. It was still really just sort of a, in, a pie in the sky vision. And uh, in the spring of 2016, I started to hear more and more from people about at how the hardware capacity was evolving. And it seemed like it may be plausible for us to begin to initiate this process um, of, of trying to have something, a consumer you know, priced handheld spectrometer that could test nutrient density in real time. Um, so we uh, set about trying to engage the process. And as we, as we thought into it, we identified that there were really a couple of pieces to this puzzle. It wasn't just about building a meter, about building this piece of kit we actually had to figure out what quality was first. Um, and that really we needed to not only figure out what quality was, but we would like to understand what caused it because our, you know, our core constituency at the BFA has been growers, uh, people who are actively involved in the process of producing food. And our courses had been you know, ways to think more deeply, understand more, more subtly what's going on and how to work with the natural system. And so we really wanted to be able to correlate directly those management practices and environmental conditions that improved plant health and those that didn't um, so that we could do a better job teaching our courses and really be able to support growers well, because how do we know that the recommendations we're making are true, right? We, if we don't have the data to support it. Um, hopefully we've got some experience from the plants growing outside, but every year is different. The temperature is different. The water is different. The seed quality, you know, teasing out all those connections is quite difficult. So again, we started off with the idea that we wanted to build a meter that would allow people to test quality, but to accomplish that, we understood we needed to do a couple of other things also. One, which was to figure out what quality was, and then also to figure out what caused it. So 
through um, the fall of 2016, we started doing outreach, going around to conferences, talking to our friends, going on listservs. Um, and Greg Bostic uh, was one of the people who rapidly showed up. He was part of a group called, um, um, what is it, Greg? The, uh, not GOAT. Gathering, uh, for open ag the gathering for Open Science Hardware? Gosh, yes, exactly, gosh. Um, which is an open source hardware building network globally that he had helped establish that was meeting every year or two in a different continent around the world. Um, and, you know, he seemed like a, an, an amazing ally to be able to hopefully integrate into our team. <clears throat> we, you know, have the specialty in the, um, in the agronomy and the biological principles side, but not necessarily in the engineering or the, or the science side. So, um, Greg was someone we reached out to and were able to inspire to uh, engage in the process. Um, Dorn Cox as well, who was then part of um, Pharma West, but has subsequently started Open Team, was another one of the key allies we we engaged, um, and we you know put together this outline of these three steps: build a meter, figure out what quality is, figure out what causes it, and uh, presented that to our um, attendees at this conference. I believe that was the uh, February of 2017, um, and and said and said to the group, "Look, we've been talking about this for years as an organization." Um, we think it's now time to start doing this work. Um, here's the people we've put together. Here's the broad vision of how we want to accomplish it. We really think this whole thing needs to be done in the commons, open source, so that it can't be controlled and sort of sideswiped later by larger, you know, forces. Um, and we had a day long sort of series of breakout conversations and get to come together conversations and visioning. And, and by the end of it, it seemed like we had, uh, you know, general consensus from our community that this was that go for it. You know, you've been talking about it, start doing it. So um, spent a bunch of time that spring writing up uh, outlines of how we would do this and what the order of operations would be and some, you know, how much money we needed to raise to do it. Um, that summer 2017, we were able to get our first um, donation. I think it was about $25,000 from Sally Calhoun um, from the Globetrotter Foundation, uh, now No Regrets Initiative, um, which was what Greg used to build the first uh, meter, the first what we call now the Biotin Treat Meter, um, which we then shared at the conference that fall, November, December 2017. Um, and we were able to get uh, you know a couple six-figure donations to really set up the lab and, and start and start the work. So since the beginning of 2018, we really have been um, building out this, this structure of labs um, overlaid with the instrumentation and the, assess and the assessment connection, connecting it to the soil um, and management and environmental conditions and framing it all so that it can be seen and understood in relationship to itself. Um, when I was initially beginning to do outreach in the, in the fall of 2016, I was able to get to the um, meet with a number of national program leaders in Washington, D.C. at the uh, ARS, the Agricultural Research Service. It's actually in, in Maryland, just outside D.C. But I was able to make a presentation to a number of those national program leaders. And I, and I started off by saying, you know, we think there's a connection between soil health and plant health and human health. And, and one of the national program leaders, you know, basically stood up and said, you know, stop right there, stop right there. Uh, I was like, I was getting ready to be <laughs> told that you're, you're full of it. And he said, you know, so do we. We absolutely agree. Soil health and plant health and human health are totally connected, but it's too complicated. It's impossible to figure out. We can't scientifically prove the causal factors. Um, and if you understand, you know, different forms of science, you know, if you want to do a uh, you know, 100% guarantee this caused that, um, that will work well maybe in a chemistry set, an abiotic system, but it doesn't work well in a biological system. Um, you know, in a living system, there are always multiple factors present. Um, and so what I pr proposed to them, and I think we've been moving forward with, I call it an epidemiological style of analysis. Um, then I use the example of, um, you know, if there's a, a cholera outbreak in Haiti, and the, um, the health workers are trying to figure out where it is so they can you know, stop it. 
we know enough to know that um, you know cholera is waterborne. Um, oftentimes, comes from um, you know unclean water sources, and so what they'll do, you know, what the what the health workers will do in, in a cholera outbreak when someone is confirmed to have it is they'll ask them sixty questions. You know, where were you yesterday? What did you eat? Who did you talk to? Where did you go? Where did you sleep? Um, and if you get 50 people and you ask them all 60 questions and you find the patterns where, you know, all of them drank water from one of five wells, then you have a pretty good odds of, you know, where this came from. And you can go and you can test those wells and you can see this where the cholera is and you can shut them down and you can stop the outbreak. Um, that's not you know, the classic replicated randomized trial version of science that a lot of agronomists have been practicing over the past number of decades, at least in the sort of the formal university system. Although there have been a number of farmers who've been experimenting, you know, with different practices and techniques and materials and products and genetics and planting times and cedars and everything else and found out a lot of stuff. So I can say that, you know, our understanding is that a lot of these principles about how things work are generally understood by the cutting edge um, practitioners, but have not been well proven in the science. And so part of our objective in doing this work is to build a data set so that we can begin to correlate these management practices and environmental conditions with um, nutrient variations, and then be able to give guidance back to growers about, about how they can change their practices. So I think that's an important piece of this puzzle is that sort of framing about how the um, data is collected and what we're trying to accomplish more deeply. The other uh, key piece I wanted to talk about before going to the Institute was this what is quality piece. Um, you know, it's a bit of a presumption to be able to say this carrot is better than that carrot or this piece of beef is better than that piece of beef. Um, you know, to say it with confidence and empirically, requires a, a number of a number of facts, a number of, of points. And really we want to be able to connect um, those nutrient variations with human health, right? We think they should connect to plant health. We think they should connect to the animal health. Um, we think they should connect to the environmental health, but tracking that all out again is very complex. Um, and so what we've been able to do over the past uh, three years of sampling, Greg has been primarily the person coordinating and overseeing it with Dan Travist, um, is to take in a total of 21 different crops, carrots and beets and lettuce and tomato and, you know, grapes and blueberries and oats and wheat and leeks and, you know, summer squash and peppers, any number of fruits, vegetables, leaves, you know, uh, leafy vegetables and grains so far. And we've been looking at um, about 15 different elements and a couple different compounds. So copper and zinc and, you know, um, sulfur and um, phosphorus and potassium, antioxidants and polyphenols. And we've developed a database which shows pretty categorically that the variations between the carrot with the highest level of copper and the carrot with the lowest level is dramatic. Um, you know, maybe five to one, maybe 10 to one. Um, and then when we look at things like antioxidants and polyphenols, the higher order compounds, it's, it's at least 25 to one. In some cases it's, you know, 100 or 200 to one this carrot has 200, you know, has as many antioxidants in it as those 200 carrots. So you'd have to eat 200 of these carrots to get the antioxidant content that you get out of this one. So those variations are quite significant. Um, and we feel pretty comfortable at this point identifying them and saying, yes, you know, we've done enough data collection to say this is significant. However, just because you can say it's got more antioxidants does not necessarily mean you can say it's better. Um, because better and worse, we presume, has to do with a full suite of different elements and compounds, not just antioxidants and polyphenols, but amino acids and lipids and, you know, carbohydrates and enzymes and vitamins, um, a suite of plant secondary metabolites. Um, this work of actually characterizing what is the full spectrum of nutrients that are in a food, and then what's the high and low in that food really hasn't been done yet. I'll just give a couple of examples that have come across my desk, I guess you would say recently. Um, one of them is a re researcher um, operating out of, of I think, BU, um, Bar Barabasi, I believe is his last name. And they did a, a project with garlic and they looked into the literature 
um, and said, you know, what are all the compounds that have been studied in garlic? And they found about, I think it was 2,300 compounds that have been studied in the scientific literature of all the papers they could find, you know, um, out there. And then they went and took garlic and they actually put it through cutting edge instrumentation to see what are all the compounds they could find. Um, and it was more than 10,000. So um, there is a, a massive amount of different nutrients that are present in food. Um, and to begin to, you know, to presume to say this is better or this is worse in our mind and our thoughts requires understanding what's there to begin with first. And so um, that's part of what's so exciting about where we're at now and why we're pivoting from the Real Food Campaign framing to the Bionutrient Institute framing is um, we've been able to uh, get some, you know, significant funding uh, earlier this year from the, the Grantham Foundation, uh, Grantham Environmental Trust. Um, we've uh, set up a, a new lab here in Massachusetts. Um, the, the fancy instruments are being uh, calibrated, turned on next week. Um, and we're going to be able to go from looking at 15 elements and two compounds to, you know, 500 compounds or 1,000 compounds or 10,000 compounds. We have the instrumentation now to actually look at that full suite from the amino acids to the lipids to the enzymes to the vitamins to the terpenoids, alkaloids, phenolics, everything. Um, so being able to make that, being able to make that leap um, in our work from proof of concept, which I like to think we've, I like to say we've been for the past three years, 2018, 2019, 2020, um, you know, setting up the first lab in Michigan, setting up the second lab in at Chico State in California, the third lab in France, uh, going from the first year, uh, just a few people sending in samples that they received from their, uh, they got at the local grocery stores and farmers markets to last year working with 150 farmers, um, two, two crops in 2018 to 21 crops in 2020. Um, now the instrument, we're hopefully going to be shipping it out next week, the, um, the updated version of the bionutrient meter, which has calibrations for eight different crops. Um, so you can, you know, flash a light and say, antioxidant level, we think it's in the 84th percentile. It's probably between the 70th and the 100th, but it's, we're going to guess if the, it, it's likely between the 70th and the 100th, and we're going to, we're going to say 84. So we're, we're able to do that with eight different crops now with all the samples that have gone through the lab. Um, so we have a functioning meter, a handheld portable consumer price point, uh, open source meter. We've got variations defined in nutrient levels um, on 21 different crops. We've got a framework for looking at soil management practices, environmental conditions, you know, fertility programs, um, genetic you know, variation overlaid on soil carbon and soil biological activity and soil minerals overlaid on nutrient variation. So we've built this framework out to be able to answer these deeper questions um, and now we've uh, begun to receive the, the resources necessary to take it to the next level. Um, and so that's why we're excited to launch the Bionutrient Institute. Um, as I said before, bionutrientinstitute.org. Um, basically everything that was on realfoodcampaign.org will now be there. So if you wanna sign up to be a, a citizen scientist to send in samples from your grocery store or a farmer's market, if you wanna be a farm partner or grower partner to send in samples from your um, that you're growing um, an organizational partner, whether it's a nonprofit or a company, um, that's going to be the place to engage us through. Um, so I said one more, one more point I wanted to make. It's just a tangent, but it was very interesting. I heard this in conversation a couple of days ago from a group that was studying pepper. Um, and they were looking, they're, they're trying to track out all these compounds and plants as well. And there was a, a specific compound in pepper that apparently is really good for um, fatty liver. You know, if you've got too much, you know, imbalance of fat in your system and, you know, the, the, whatever the dynamics are that cause um, a fatty liver, there's a compound in pepper that can effectively ameliorate that. And so this group was looking at all the pepper samples they could find globally, and they're looking for this compound and the pepper that was graded grade A, which was, you know, the fancy expensive stuff that you get to put in your grinder, had very little of this compound in it. The, the, the in, as pepper is graded currently in the supply chain, 
the pepper that was grated at the lowest level that was turned into pepper oil actually had a hundred times as much of this health promoting compound. Um, you know, the way the market's working right now is not based on nutrition, it's based on volume and aesthetic. Um, another conversation from a couple of days ago has to do with, with beef. And we're looking at going beyond you know, leaves and fruits and roots and grains to start doing animal products. And it looks like we'll be able to do that this year uh, with our you know, more deep level of analysis. Um, so I was talking to this researcher about secondary metabolites in beef. And you know, interestingly, uh, when a cow is eating from a pasture that has dozens of different varieties of plants in it, all of those plant secondary metabolites, all those medicinal compounds that are in the plants end up being in the meat. Um, and so we can take your, your corn fed um, beef off the shelf from the grocery store and find none of these compounds. And you can take your, you know, well grass fed raised beef and find hundreds of these compounds. So from a nutritional standpoint, to be able to actually identify these compounds and then, you know, give specific guidance to consumers about um, this is better, this is worse, this is in the 20th percentile, the 80th percentile. We haven't been able to get to that point yet, um, but I think that's where we're going. So uh, very exciting to be moving forward. Um, look forward to uh, you all checking out that website. Um, there is an FAQ page on there for people who think that there's, there's things that you think um, we should be saying, but haven't said, please do, uh, you know, ask a question on the FAQ page where we were just putting this website up. I don't think we've got all the, all the pieces there um, that we want to have there, but all right. I think I took more than the 15 minutes I'd be planned for Greg, but I hope this has been a valuable overview and update. Um, and so I'm going to hand it off to you to talk about some of the specifics of the process that we've been going through. Um, maybe I'll interject occasionally and then um, in 40 minutes or so, we can go to question and answer. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Um, well, thanks for the intro. I may repeat some things, um, but hopefully not too much. So. Um, it's a complicated uh, conversation. So sometimes it's good to hear it said <laughs> in different ways by different people. I think that's right. No, I think you gave a really nice history on that. I don't think I'm going to touch on that as much. So I think that's great. Um, so yeah, I'm Craig Ostick, um, co-founder of, of RSI, and we run a lot of the technical implementation for the Biotrain Institute, uh, and I'm going to be talking today, I'll share my screen here quick. Everybody see that? Oh. Um, yes. So yeah, and, and I wrote words on the screen, um, you can mostly just listen. Um, I don't have a lot of images. There's just one slide, really. So don't don't feel like you have to watch the screen. I'm going to cover it all verbally. Um, so the topics for today that I want to cover is why do we measure what we measure right now as part of the Biodutrate Institute um, data collection effort, and how do we get there? Not too much of the history, but really, I want I want to show the logic chain, um, and then also knowing that. Um, what can and should we measure in the future? What am I excited about in this coming year or in the next two years? Where do we see some opportunities? And then um, I'm just going to walk through the 2020 data because we did we did finish up with a, a released version of that data dashboard. We showed that I think a month or two ago. It was a little bit early. It's a little more polished up now. So I'm just going to walk through a couple of a um, couple of ways that I walk through that data. Show you some interesting things that that I found. And hopefully that gives you a starting point to be able to start looking at the data yourself. Um, so those are my the three I'm going to hit. So um, so we're going to start with why we measure what we measure. Everything in this section really comes back to this goal. Um, you can design things a hundred different ways, but our initial goal was really broad: transparency of nutrient density in the food supply. That as the primary tool for a very broad level of change, right? The goal is the change, um, but this is how we're going to get there. And this is a big, big statement, right? It's not transparency of like peppered, you know, vitamin C in Michigan. It's a big statement. And therefore, uh, the, the, the bigness of the statement drove a lot of decisions 
um, down the road. So I just want to state that so you know it and you can see it as we go. So the consequence of that big statement kind of lays out these requirements and constraints that we had in determining how we were going to, to design um, the setup and then also which measure, measurements we were going to include. Um, we have three clear questions uh, that, that emerged from that. How much variation is there? What's the source of the variation? And can we predict it? Um, they, they emerge pretty straightforwardly if you just say, all right, I want transparency of nutrient density in the food supply. My answer is this pepper is a six, right? Like this pepper is a six, like <laughs> doesn't tell you anything, right? But I technically answered your question. Um, so the first thing you have to know is a six out of what, right? A six from four to seven or a six from zero to a hundred. Um, the second question is why is it a six, right? Like what, what was the cause of it being a six? And is that, if that cause is knowable to me, can I make a different decision on the basis of knowing it? I can buy this versus that, or I can, I can have a preference for planting this seed versus that one if I'm a farmer or this management practice. Uh, and then the prediction element is really about scalability. Um, if we can't predict variation using a meter, using just data, maybe, um, using information from the person who's looking at the the particular crop, um, then we're always going to be stuck in having to send samples to a lab, and that's just expensive and not scalable, and, and we don't achieve our goal of, of having that very broad impact. So those three questions, they're just, they just naturally emerge from that big statement, the big goal. And then finally, the, the, the second piece is nutrient density has to be a meaningful thing. I think Dan you know, made this point. Uh, it sounds almost like an obvious statement, but um, returning the value of a single compound is not that meaningful for human health, right? Um, we need a wide enough array of compounds or a selection of compounds or measurements that um, have uh, direct connections to human health in order to be meaningful. This is an ongoing process, um, but it was, we, we did try to identify at least the first set of things um, to, be, to be meaningful. Um, and then finally, we don't have infinite resources. So up until now, at least, and going forward, but certainly up until now, we've had really limited resources. That's a constraint. And we still want to have this really broad impact. So how do we use the resources we have to create something that's scalable and have the most impact we can? So let's focus first on these first three questions. How do those lead into how we can answer them, knowing that that's what we're, what we're working with here? So, and again, Dan mentioned this. We have two options for how we can collect data to answer those questions. Um, we can do targeted studies, right? That's your classic like side-by-side -side trials. It's, uh, it's the kind of work that's done in academic research or in a large scale in private companies. Um, a lot of this already happens, right? It's saying, I'm gonna plant the same thing in the same conditions and irrigate here and don't irrigate here. And then I'm gonna measure uh, the change in nutrient density between the two. Um, those are really great. And they allow you to make really specific statements um, of pretty high confidence, but they also have a lot of requirements. They require that you have land, that you can do a side-by-side -side trial. They also kind of predefine what it is you're trying to look at, right? In a side-by-side -side trial, you can't say, well, I'm just gonna see what happens, right? You have to say, no, 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 this one's irrigated and this one's not, right? This one's managed this way and this one's not. So we're predetermining um, what we are looking at in these kind of trials. Um, so targeted studies have value, but they're largely already happening and they kind of predetermine an outcome. And I think based on those three requirements we had, we tended towards another option, which is an observational survey, right? That's where we're not, we're not doing a side-by-side -side trial. We're just looking out in the world and we're saying, you know what? I'm just gonna see what exists. It doesn't require controlled conditions, which is a plus. We don't have to have a plot of land and do side-by-side -side trials. We don't have to make a lot of assumptions. There was a little bit of assumptions because um, I have to know what to ask you. If I go to the store, I have to know which questions to ask. If I don't ask it, I can't make a comparison. If I don't ask if you're organic, I can't compare organic to not organic. So there's a little bit there, but for the most part, we can collect a lot of information um, and not have a bunch of assumptions. Um, 
And it allows you to make more generalized statements about the state of the world if you've done a good job in your survey design and that kind of stuff. But the downside is you need a lot of data. Um, so there's downsides and upsides to each of these options. But we chose the second for a couple of reasons. One, because in order to answer these, especially last two questions, you need a lot of data anyway. You need a lot of really diverse data. Um, there's no way to build the kind of models to get predictions without a lot of diverse data, um, or at least we didn't feel that way. So we decided to go with this observational survey, and that's what we've been doing for the last couple of years. Uh, so that there's there's the motivation. So um, so now the question becomes. Oh, so here's I just want to give an example of like what kind of statements can you make from these two things? You know, if you do a targeted study, what kind of statement can you make when you're done? versus an observational one. In a targeted study, you can say, say you did a comparison of no-till beans and tilled beans. You can say, no-till beans have higher antioxidants than tilled beans based on my study. But your study was done in Ohio on sandy soils with this variety to Dan's point of talking about you know, multi-factor analysis. So you're limited in what you can say, but what you can say, you can say fairly accurately, right? So if I was an Ohio farmer on sandy soils running that variety, like this is a fantastic study for me. If I'm a Washington farmer um, or you know, somewhere else, I may go, well, I don't know if this applies. Whereas an observational study, um, we can make that same statement, but be a lot more confident that it's true on average. The downside of that is the, the no-till beans and the tilled beans may have huge, huge number of samples at a really wide range, but the average difference between the two could be statistically significant, right? So there's still a ton of no-till beans that are worse than tilled beans. Uh, it's just that on average, one's a little better than it, and the other, and we can say it with statistical significance. So the downside of that is, well, upside of that is as a user on average, I, should, I know that I can probably eat no-till beans, they're gonna be better for antioxidants in this case. But as a farmer, does it mean I should take this to the bank and bet my whole farm on no-till beans? Not really, because you have to look at the rest of the variation. And that's hopefully when we get to the end, I'm gonna show you, you know, our goal isn't to answer all these questions, really our goal is to empower people to start looking at this data and hopefully um, become, uh, make be better decision makers in their own space um, with that context. So. This is hopefully this is useful background. Okay, so now we're down to all right, what are we going to collect? We know we're doing an observational study. Uh, we know we have some financial constraints. We know we want to have a really broad impact, and we know it has to be human relevant. So for nutrient density, you know, really our limitations were it, it had to be inexpensive because we were going to collect a lot of samples. There was no way we could it could be $500 a sample, it had to be scalable which is connected to cost, but not only, right? Um, and that's, um, I think a lot of the stuff that the Boston lab in this new injection of funding, you know, it, 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 do, it has a different goal. Um, if I have a $500,000 piece of equipment, but it costs me 50 cents to run every sample, that's actually pretty inexpensive, but it's not very scalable because if I want someone in France to do it and they have to ship fresh sample, then they're gonna to have to buy a $500,000 instrument, right? So our goal was for it to be scalable. Um, it had to be human relevant, like I pointed out, um, the, the, the measurements. And then it needs to be at least to some degree validated by experts. That's important because you know you could come up with something yourself that's, that's relevant for nutrient density that you think is really good, but it's not out there in the literature. No one else has run it. It's not validated. Even if you think it's magical, it's probably not one we should focus on. So we also collect a, kind of a lot of crop data. I'm not even really gonna talk about it in this talk, but just understand that we are also collecting data on all of the samples that come in, on where they came from, if they're from a store, what brand, what store, if they're from a farm, all the farm practices, down to you know, day by day activity level of detail, um, soil samples in there and the properties of that, conditions and genetics. So, but I just, I'll put that aside. All right. So, for nutrient density, what, what were our options? What could we look at? Um, you know, we're not, this is just your classic nutrition facts. If you were to think about um, nutrition, this is the most obvious place to look. Um, we're not really interested in this top section. 
Like we're not interested in for kale if it has more or less fat or more or less carbohydrates. Um, we're really interested in this bottom section, macro and micronutrients. Uh, and then also other items that aren't even necessarily on the list, right? The kind of specific compounds that Dan was talking about. Um, these items, um, this is where they're generally done. If we were to outsource them at the lab, um, there are labs that do bulk testing for these kind of labels or other bulk nutrition testing. And then there's a lot of academic research and methods based on other specific compounds. And the, the short of it is that these are just, they're ex, it's expensive to outsource. Um, I think um, it's, it's possible to do some of the individual measurements less expensively, especially these other compounds. Um, but because we can only do one compound at a time in a way that was scalable, meaning not with a lot of expensive equipment, those individual one-off compounds were not very human health relevant and often didn't apply across lots of crops. So sure, maybe we could measure lycopene and watermelon, but like no one cares about lycopene and the other 18 crops, right? So it's, we have to be, we had to be efficient in the things that we chose. So th hopefully that's a good framing for like the constraints, what our options were, what we were thinking, how we got to that decision point. Um, and now I'll just kind of show you know, where, where we ended up. And this is for this last year. Um, these are all the crops that we ran up here. Um, we have changed and adjusted this a little bit over time, um, but this is the 2020 version. Um, so we'll start over here with the crop methods. We measure the weight density, um, dry weight. That's really important in order to get an accurate um, final measure for anything you're doing. Um, then uh, we measure surface reflectance, which is what we're attempting to build these um, nutrient density estimates on. It's just flashing a light at the sample and see what comes back, or flashing a light at a ground or processed sample of some kind and seeing if that helps the prediction. So we do that. We measure bricks, again, widely known and understood. Antioxidants, we chose that because it represents a very large class of compounds and it's really well studied and it doesn't require expensive equipment. Polyphenols, similar reasoning, and then minerals uh, using the XRF. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that tool in a minute, but we do get a suite of minerals, including potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, uh, calcium, zinc, uh, magnesium, manganese, um, but th th that's the sort of human relevant list. We get some other ones that are less relevant to human health. And then on the soil side, um, we, we collect a soil sample next to the crop sample and we take the top four inches, then the next four inches of two soil horizons, and then separately we measure surface reflectance, pH, total organic carbon, soil respiration, which is an estimate of biological activity. Basically, if you add a little water to the sample, how much of a biological flush do you get when you measure that flush? Um, minerals using the same tool, the XRF. And then this last year and this coming year, we're also sending all the samples off um, to Logan Labs to do their full suite of testing. And Logan Labs does, I think, a Malik 3 extraction and then does some uh, recommendations, sort of standard agronomic recommendations on the basis of that. So that's um, extractable minerals and, and things like that. Um, so those are the things that we chose, like after all that caveating that I provided before. Um, and ultimately, what's nice about this suite of things is that, uh, like in the case of the lab in France, when they said, hey, we're interested in running these methods, uh, it wasn't more than ten dollars or $15,000 to start up the whole lab. Um, so it allows us to be scalable and ultimately then have impact and identify partners in a way that um, using more expensive tooling or even just more expensive um, labor, you know, uh, would have been. So, and you can go look at um, our testing protocols here. Uh, and um, this will be updated in the Bionutrient website. It's just not right now. We're going to get all the stuff over there, but just so you have that link. Um, great. Now I want to talk about um, the, the XRF, um, which really I think is kind of a secret weapon. I think if we didn't have the minerals component of these things, this would be a lot less compelling but I do think the minerals component makes it a lot more compelling. Um, so this little instrument here is the Bruker Tracer 5i XRF. 
Uh, it's an instrument that shoots x-rays at a sample and then measures the light that comes back. Um, and what's nice about it is uh, it gives you a pretty direct response or a direct estimate of total minerals in the sample. Um, and for crops especially, that's really relevant because total minerals is, that's, those are directly human relevant. They're really well studied. They're externally validated. Um, and normally, if we were to outsource those, they'd be quite expensive, um, like 30 to $50 to do an external lab per sample. With the XRF, um, even though the XRF itself is fairly expensive, like $40,000, um, so it has a high upfront cost. What's nice about it, and this is quite specific to our application, is it has a near zero per test cost. Running a sample of it is just a couple of minutes of a person's time to run. Um, it has a higher error than sending it off uh, to the lab. And we have had to do some development and Jill and Rai Zotero, who sold us the unit, has been really helpful in trying to support us in, the, in improving those calibrations. Um, but it's, it's taken a while to get um, really concrete results from the unit. But I think regardless, it's an extremely important component. So what I said before is scalability. The, the reason that even though this is an expensive unit, it's still scalable is because we can run it on dry ground samples. So the lab in France can actually dry and ground all their samples. And minerals don't like evaporate into the air, right? Like once you dry and ground it, you could send it to us six months later and we could run it. So they can just send us a big box of dried samples and we can run it on this machine. Um, so that, that, that makes it scalable in the way that things that require a fresh piece of produce, for example, um, uh, you know, secondary metabolites, we can't ship those from France to here if we had a really expensive machine. So I think this has been a really great tool. We have to continue to improve it, um, but what it brings, I think, to the project is really important. Um, Given, given all of that, I just wanted to make sure it was clear how this process then ultimately ended up working. So, um, so this is the process itself. Um, people, you know, individuals, farmers, and organizations sign up to send in samples. They fill out management form or they fill out information about the sample. They send the sample then to us. It takes a couple of days to get to the mail. We receive it. We intake it. Uh, scan it, run polyphenols, antioxidants. We run those minerals, the XRF I was just talking about. Um, this is the picture of our lab in Ann Arbor, but also the Chico lab also runs the same thing and the lab in France does the same thing. So we are all running the exact same process. We're using the same software, using the same methods. Um, and then if the sample came from a farm, we're also running the soil methods on that. And then in both cases, we're delivering that data back to users this has been a struggle. Hopefully you'll see that we've made some progress on delivering that data back and making it more interpretable at the end of this talk. Um, we have a lot of other people involved in this too. We have a whole team of people who support and interact with uh, all of our partners to make sure that data is collected and they're supported. We have a team of software developers um, who is working on the, the tooling for delivering data back, um, benchmarking, and we have some exciting stuff there. So. This is just so you can understand exactly what we're doing in a practical sense. Um, now I just wanna talk about things in the future. So I said a lot of things before that were based on a bunch of assumptions um, and the information that we had when we started the project. And some of those assumptions and information have changed and that's opened up um, more and better opportunities going forward. I think, so here's just sort of a list of things that I see that we can do better, change, improve based on that. So one is side-by-side -side trials, that, that kind of, um, you know, if you go back, um, you know, I talked about targeted studies versus observa observational studies and the pluses and the minuses. We went with an observational study because that's what was feasible. Now that we have a lot of data from that, a lot of that data actually motivates targeted studies. We can say, hi, huh, it looks like in the observational study, we see a difference between this and that, but that difference is small um, and it's a small number of samples. Let's go do a targeted study on that. Um, so I think we have a lot of 
data like that. And I, I hope we can engage more people to investigate and interrogate the data we've collected um, to get that. And I think we can do it both within our network, with our citizen science partners, with our grower partners, you know, as, as simple as a grower partner can say, hey, I wanna send in four different fields and I'm gonna set up this field and this field as a side-by-side -side trial, just for my own interest. It's like, great, communicate that with us. We'd love to share it out. We'd love to help support people answer these questions themselves. It's not just all about what we want. Use this as a tool to do your own side-by-side -side trials. In addition to that, the Boston Lab is gonna be doing sort of larger scale side-by-side -side trials as well, which I think is really exciting. Um, that's one. Dan already mentioned more detailed analysis and compounds, you know, rather than, you know, us struggling to do wet chem to do two compounds with that sort of additional equipment, we should be able to do a lot more. So there's a lot of work there. Um, also within our core um, citizen science partners and our core lab network, um, we are trying to expand those simpler, lower cost methods as well. So we're going to looking at doing sugars, uh, soluble and insoluble fiber and beta carotene this year. I don't know if we're going to get the data in this year, but we are going to get the methods developed and tested. So I think that's exciting. Um, there's a lot of improved interpretability. That's been a struggle in the past, right? Like I said, if I say this carrot's a six, that's useless. If I say this carrot's a six from zero out of a hundred, it's better. If I say this carrot's a six from zero to a hundred for antioxidants, or let's say for let's say for zinc. Okay, that's better. At least you know what zinc is. <laughs> now, the next step is to say, this carrot's a six from zero to 100 for zinc, and the USDA recommends having 15, right? Uh, or even better, the USDA recommends for a person of your sex and your you know, weight and your age to have a 25, right? That's the personalized medicine um, component. So. I'm excited that we we are now to the point where like we can start to talk about recommended daily values and start to really show people in a clear and visualized way, here's where you are, here's where you want to be. Um, and here's five choices, right? Here's five things that we measured and where they sit. And you can decide, you can make purchasing decisions, you can make eating decisions, and you can make planting decisions. Um, Improving minerals data, I talked about the XRF and how awesome it is. Um, we do need to improve our ability to calibrate it on a crop by crop basis. We've kind of exceeded that original calibration standard. Uh, and, and I think um, we have an opportunity to improve those values. They are some of the most valuable outcomes that we generate. So making them more accurate is better. And I think ultimately those, that information can be really useful for the broader community of other projects that also use the XRF. Um, expanding. The amount of external testing last year was the first year we subsampled soils and sent it off to other labs like Logan Labs. We know that a lot of people use Logan Labs and are already doing that. So including that as a standard part of what we offer our um, grower partners feels like a no brainer. We can, um, we can do a lot of the pre-work to make the costs on that more efficient. So um, my, my hope is we can expand that and deliver more value back with each of these samples. And then last, certainly, certainly not least, is we just need to really build a better community. Um, I think we've reached out to people in the past about helping us identify better lab methods, you know, reviewing the data, um, trying to do some of the data analysis. And I think um, because we were still sort of in that beta phase, it wasn't valuable enough to other groups to do that. And I think we're now to the point where um, we have some pretty compelling data and a lot of potential impact. And, um, and I think we can just do a better job of reaching out as well. So, uh, you know, hopefully we can build a group of people who can support identifying better nutritional measurements. Um, we already have through Open Team and partners there, uh, communities who are improving our crop, crop data collection. Um, uh, like I said, sharing experiments within our communities. And then one of the things I'm kind of most excited about, I think we're doing not at all, and we should be doing a lot, based on some of this data is to talking to breeders. Um, genetics plays a really, really important role here. So we can talk about changes in management and that's real, um, but specifically identifying um, varieties and starting to measure um, nutrient density in varieties at the point of varietal creation 
uh, and reporting that to people who are going to be buying these seeds, I think is really good. Uh, to, to Dan's point, um, uh, I don't want to, we don't want to be reporting these things as a negative to people who don't have them or as a negative to people who score low today on what we're doing. And we're primarily interested in establishing a framework so that as we go forward and we can improve um, and increase the number of nutritional measurements we can make at a reasonable cost, we're going to have a great framework to be able to deliver that out to all the decision makers in, the, in this food supply chain. Um, so that was really it for the presentation part. I'm going to walk a little bit through this Data Explorer Data Dashboard. Um, you can find more information about all this stuff at BioNutrientInstitute.org. Um, Dan already said you can become a partner. Uh, we're always looking for organizational partners. That could be um, academics who are running side-by-side -side trials and want to include nutritional measurements in their work. It could be you know, individual growers. It could be grower networks. It could be supply chains. Um, also citizen scientists, people in cities. And also, if you're a developer, if you want to do data analysis, um, we do a lot of that. So um, that would be sort of specialty, but feel free to contact us if that's your interest. Um, so unless there's, unless we want to stop for questions, Dan, I'm just going to roll into the next piece. It'll probably take like no more than 10 minutes. I think, yeah, we talked about that being something that would be part of the presentation. And yeah. you know, the presumption is half an hour for questions at four. So cool. we got about nine minutes left. We nailed it. Um, all right. Okay, so if there is not now, there will be, um, can we just put it up today and Dan or Chris, if you wanna link it into the chat, a link to this dashboard from the Bionutri Institute website. I'm sorry, I don't have it, um, but maybe somebody could get into the chat. Um, and it, the other- It'll be there in a couple of days if it's not okay. right now, so. Yep. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's, this is all in process. Uh, but it will be there in a couple of days. You can go to the bioinstitute.org and you'll find it there. The other thing that's not there yet, but will be soon is this video walkthrough. It'll be very similar to what I'm gonna give you today. So if you're like, I don't know what to do with this, like click on that video walkthrough and it'll be five to seven minutes and it'll, it'll get you understanding what you need to do. So, um, great. So, um, so this is just a representation of the data that we collected so far in 2020. We are going to try to pull in the 2019 data as well. And my hope is as 2021 data comes in, we can start to populate this as well. So expect this data set to grow. Um, and it just gives you the ability um, by, by a bunch of things to make comparisons, say what's high and what's low and, and, um, and, and maybe learn some things. So. Uh, the first thing I want to highlight is each of these columns represents one of the tests that we ran in the lab. So we ran antioxidants, uh, we ran bricks, we measured all of our minerals right in the crop itself. Um, we have this little combined minerals function, just sometimes it's nice to combine them together. Individual minerals can be hard. So this is combined minerals that are relevant to human health, bricks, this kind of stuff. You can also run uh, for samples that had soils. Um, organic carbon and pH and polyphenols, I'm sorry, organic carbon and pH and uh, soil minerals as well. And that's the soil sample that was next to the crop sample. So remember that soil and crop samples are always connected one to one. So that's what's here. And you can do that in each of these columns. And then on the side here, it shows you what the type of the four, um, sorry, the category of sample. We have a lot more data about these samples, but these are kind of top level categories that we created. So a biological sample is someone who identified as a biological farming operation. Transitioning is the same. Some of these are certifications. So this would include store samples because we'll know if it's certified organic. This no-till would not include store samples. We don't know if something in the store is no-till. This would include only samples collected from farms. But um, these are these top level categories people are interested in. And you can see that each of these bars represent on average for the, you can see 15 samples from five different sources, which were marked as biological. Um, biological samples tended to be high in antioxidants at the top end, um, whereas organic tended to be low in antioxidants at the bottom end. And this is the distribution in between. 
That's what this is saying here. And then same thing for crop minerals, right? Biological tends to be high, uh, but in this case, actually organic is about somewhere in the middle. Um, and then BQI, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at that a little bit. We're gonna change this name probably, but it's just a quality index. It's helpful sometimes to combine terms together so you can look at things in a combined way. So the, this quality index is just antioxidants, polyphenols, minerals, and either bricks or proteins, proteins in the case of wheat and oats. That's all BQI is, it's just a, it's a composite measure. It is not some be all end all representative of nutritional density. It just, it's helpful when looking at data. So, so um, yeah, so you can hover over this, you can see the sample sizes. Uh, you can see that the darker green are things that are more likely to be true, right? So we had a lot of certified organic samples, 30 from 10 different sources. So this is a, we're pretty confident about this average value, but we didn't have that many biological samples. So we're less confident, it's less dark green here. So you can see the greenness as a, an infinite and, and an indicator of how confident we are that this particular sample set is actually where it's marked on the graph. So you can kind of click through this. We can say what's highest in bricks, certified organic seems to be highest, no spray is next, right? We get on individual minerals, calcium. So anyway, that's what this does. So let's go back to where we started with antioxidants. All right, you can go down and choose a crop. So let's look at a different crop like wheat. Okay, our information on wheat is a little different. We're not gonna have as many categories, that's fine. Um, but it's showing, wow, there's 84 no-till samples from 28 sources, and they are a lot higher than everything else for antioxidants and for minerals and for BQI, so that's interesting. Um, so let's dive into that and take a look. Oh, I also wanna show um, when you hover over these things, um, well, so on the side here shows where all the sample points are coming from, so I'm gonna point that out. All right, so let's, if you click just, on this. Just one second, Greg, if I may just yep. interact, interject on this piece, because this is a, you know, a, a part that I think, you know, we've identified recently. <clears throat> You know, when you are doing that sort of that broad survey type of assessment, um, we're trusting the farmers who send in the samples to report all the details. And so there's there is a there is a you know a statistical anomaly I would say in this chart that um, the growers who sent in generally the best quality. Um, You're gonna give it away, Dan. That's where I'm going. Don't Is give it away. Common? Okay, good. Because yeah, I, I don't yeah, want people yeah. to think that. You no, know, I'm not going to do that. No, 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 no. No, that's, that's good. Go. That, <laughs> not what we found. All right. It's as long as you're covering that point. Key point. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get. It. I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna yeah. get it. All right. So let's do this. So I'm gonna click on this BQI, and what's cool now is if I click here somewhere, uh, it's actually gonna show me all the data points. Right. So let me walk you through this. This is showing antioxidants, low antioxidants on the right, on the left here, high antioxidants on the right. Uh, and it's showing each of those categories. Here's our no-till, here's our certified organic, here's our cover crops, here's our tillage. So same categories we had before, but now instead of seeing sort of an average value, we're seeing all the data points across the whole thing. And the one thing that, if you're to take away one thing from this, look at the amount of variation, right? Even though we're seeing an average difference, this is the average between all the samples and no-till. Wow, yeah, it's higher on average. But man, there is a ton of variation. And that is true for everything in this data set. Don't expect anything to line up beautifully where all the samples are all stuck in one little side. It's always a lot of variation. And there's a lot for us to learn and to dive into. But to Dan's point, look at this no-till. Like it certainly is a lot better than the average sample. And furthermore, it's significantly better than tillage, like even more so than all wheat samples. So let's interrogate that a little bit. And I'm, I might take another like three minutes. And I think it's worth going through this one because it's an interesting one. And hopefully it gives you guys a pathway to do your own investigation. So if you hover over these, you're going to see each point and what it is. Um, so this point, if I click on it, it stays there. This is wheat. 
uh, shows the variety Keldon, and it's from the Northwest, right? And you can go down and you can see a bunch of other stuff if that data was collected and you can go look at the soil sample and stuff. Um, so, so, so please go investigate that stuff. There's stuff in there. But uh, let's see if there's anything else similar between these things. So here is another one from the Northwest. Oops, I should close this, sorry. This is from the Northwest. 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 A lot of stuff from the Northwest. So now we should say, well, I wonder if this no-till effect is actually a Northwest effect. We can, we can ask that question. So if you come down here, um, you can look at presets, which is cool. And I'll do one of those after this, but you can also scroll down and you can pick other things. So in the climate region, I can say, well, I want to choose Northwest. So give me a filter that lets me see uh, as a row, just samples that are from the Northwest. There's 108 of them, by the way. Now, give me a filter for all the samples that are just not from the Northwest. Watch, this is super cool. If I click on this once, it's from the Northwest. If I click on it twice, it's explicitly not from the Northwest. So there's 190 samples not from the Northwest. I'm gonna add that filter too. So now let's scroll back up. Hey there. Did I get them? I didn't get them. Oh. Maybe we broke something in the last two minutes. This is like the whole shtick. Um, but uh, you should, we should be able to add a, um, add a row. Oh, there it is, not Northwest. Sorry, I added it twice. I just wasn't paying attention. So um, here's all the things not from the Northwest. And here's all the things from the Northwest. And you can see it overlays really well with our tillage. And I deleted my no-till, but uh, the no-till. So really what's happening here is not necessarily a tillage effect. It's an effect of this location. And in fact, the effect here is a bunch of growers from the Northwest. Uh, we're in a similar group with similar practices, um, including no-till. And it may simply be that group. Uh, it may be the fact that it's from the Northwest. It may be a combination of those things. So, um, you know, this gave us the ability to um, see differences among practices investigate those differences by clicking around and looking to see what we see, creating new filters um, based on things that we feel like we learned, and then investigating to see if those filters line up with our expectations. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's um, an interesting sort of initial overview of what this can do. There's a lot of other stuff you can do. Obviously you can look at other things. Um, you can look at, um, Combined minerals, which I think is really interesting. There's still some um, some issues with this. We'll have to get it cleaned up. But um, you can look at other crops. We can look at beets, for example. Um, so anyway, take a look at this. Um, hopefully, this is a nice overview, and it sort of gave you a sense of you know what you can learn in a single run. So yeah, I think that's it. Great. <laughs> So there's a bunch here, and it's a great foundation, uh, we hope, for this process. And uh, we're getting into the place where we can actually begin to engage it more, more comprehensively. So um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, uh, thank you for all the work, Greg, not just the presentation, but all the, all the creativity and effort and life force you've been putting into this project for the past uh, number of years. It, without you, it certainly would not <laughs> be where it is. So. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to start uh, reading out the questions here, and then we'll, I guess, see who answers them. Um, uh, Bill T uh, says, as for seeds and breeding, the seed industry sends the best seeds to big growers and worst to the home gardener market. Um, I would say potentially because the home gardeners aren't asking for the better ones. So yeah that's the that's the way it is uh, <laughs> people who are in the business know know the importance of seed quality so even within very even within a a, a a variety type there are you know healthier seeds and less healthy seeds and so they are it seems sorted by industry and distributed based on uh, market 
um, market demand. So, <clears throat> um, yeah. Um, Torben asks, are you aware of uh, Greg Schumacher's work? It seems to be very similar to yours. So I'm wondering if there's any cooperation. Um, Greg Schumacher uh, is a part of uh, Teak Origin. Uh, there's a couple other partners there. Uh, yes, absolutely familiar with them. Um, they're based here in Massachusetts. Um, started as a project, I think, at MIT Food Lab, and now they've got their uh, main lab in um, uh, Red Outside, Red Outside of Boston. Um, yeah, they have been working to um, with sort of big uh, um, supermarket chains. I think uh, Tesco's in England and Walmart here and a few others. Um, I think they started working with Target originally. Uh, and they what they've been doing is sampling crops off the shelf from those uh, stores and assessing the nutrients that are in them in relationship to what the USDA says is on the package. And so Greg showed us that that USDA label before, if you look at, you know, carrots, they'll say vitamin D and, you know, every six inch carrot in contains 110% of your USRDA for vitamin D or something like that. <clears throat> we know that, that, you know, vitamin D is not uniform in, in carrots. It actually varies greatly. And so what Teak Origin has been doing is basically publishing reports to say this week at Walmart, the blueberries are, you know, 115% of the overall USDA, what's supposed to be in them. And at uh, Whole Foods, they're at 80% um, in this in this geographic region. So um, their model is not really to try to identify the complete variation of nutrient levels in crops and to develop a, a standard based on that. Their model is to take the USDA average and say, where things sit above or below it. Um, what we found with our, with our data collection is that the, the variation is massive and the average is poor. So while there may be a, you know, a, a bell curve of variation, um, most stuff is at the bottom. And so the USDA average actually does pretty honestly correlate with what we found as what's average. Um, it's just that it's in the 15th or 20th percentile of what's possible. And so, um, so that is what that's what Teak's been doing. Um, we've had a number of conversations over the years, a couple quite recently, um, but certainly a openness to collaboration. It's just a question of um, time, money, logistics. Everybody's got a lot going on, um, but certainly there's a you know active um, open open communication between us. I think I was just on the call with with Greg a couple of days ago. So yes, very familiar with them and appreciate what they're doing. Um, as a as a piece. Um, oh, and then Shervin's second question is, if you think there are big differences between your project, interested in hearing what they are. I think I, I, think I covered that. Um, all right, so, oh, and uh, Dan Travis, um, also by directly working with farmers, we hope that we are able to identify the drivers of nutrient density and support growers to produce more nutrient dense food. Thank you, Dan, very important point. Not only are we trying to <clears throat> define the complete variation, but we're trying to identify causal or, you know, environmental conditions that are, that correlate to that variation, because um, our objective is really to support, a, you know, an improvement in practice. Thank you. Very good, very good point. Uh, <clears throat> okay, Sherry has a, a long question. Um, understanding that flavor and taste is very subjective would you have any interest in doing a citizen-based flavor comparison observation as part of the data collection? I would want to pose this to the eater as a rating system, not based on like versus dislike, but an evaluation of levels of sweet, sour, bitter, salty, umami. Also, in addition to the health benefits as seen in the compounds, would you also be willing to, to open the conversation to flavor enjoyment as part of the healthy food intake? Um, these things could fall into the observational survey data collection. I know that uh, flavor is a part of some of the sampling that's been going on in the lab. Greg, do you want to touch on, you know, the the lab the lab crew has been doing that. I think certainly Sherry broadly we're open to that kind of collaboration, but the logistics time effort in energy um, would need to be considered. But, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we we actually do have if you go um, to the dashboard, we did collect um, to, uh, sweetness, flavor, and taste scores but it's for a pretty small number of samples. 
And I don't feel like we, we did do some background research on people and how people score those things typically. Um, and so we, you know, a, a little bit, but there's so much variation in individual taste. I feel like we, um, having someone who really knows the background on that would be, would be great and willing to work with us to develop that component. Because who, who would be doing it is the person who's sending the sample. Realistically, it's the farmer or the citizen science partner who's collecting in the store. There's no way they're gonna ship a carrot for two days and have somebody in a lab eat it. Um, which means that it's not the same person eating it, which means there's a lot of variation, but um, we, I, we'd absolutely love it. Like, please let, please contact us if that's an area you feel like you could contribute or, or provide background or thoughts or, yeah. Cool. Um, <clears throat> Matt asks, how much influence on nutrient density comes from the grower themselves? Um, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> we don't know how much, we, A, we don't know what a nutrient density is, and then we're trying to track out as many of these metrics as possible. Uh, thus far, we've been focusing on physical plane um, environmental conditions. So, um, you know, did you till? How deeply did you use cover crops? Which ones? Um, what fertilizer did you use? The conversation about intention, um, which I think is where your question is coming from, Matt, is something that's uh, very difficult to measure <clears throat> um, and then that therefore be able to define in the sort of classic Western um, scientific framework. So we do have a couple of presentations coming up on that and the importance of it as part of this series. Um, I think Faith at least has talked about that in her presentation, maybe one or two others. So we do, I mean, I personally believe that, that there's an important component there, which is the role of the farmer. Some could say it's the energy the person holds, and some could say it's just walking the field and seeing that it's dry or it needs to be mulched and acting accordingly. So, you know, what's the balance between your presence causing things to be managed differently versus your presence inherently having some value? Um, love to be able to get to the point to be able to answer that question, but I think it's still <laughs> a, a bit of a ways off. I, I, I can't answer, but I do want to show that, um, you know, if you're in here, this is our quality index uh, for wheat. If you go to this um, filter data by and select um, all sources, that separates all the sources. So each of these is a separate farm or store. So you can actually see like, you know, in the case of wheat, we actually usually collected three samples per farm. Um, and it's showing both the sample and then this uh, shows the, the variety uh, here. But you can see that like, yeah, there, I mean, you know, common management practices and varieties on a single farm, they do bunch up, you know, <laughs> stuff's not totally random. Um, the, the way to try to dig a little bit further on that is to find something that has the same variety uh, um, across multiple locations and then see if you see a lot of variation in there. So we can click on this all varieties for a single crop. Hopefully this works. So here you can see this one, uh, I believe is from multiple farms, but is the same variety. Um, and yeah, there's definitely more variation, right? So management or the person themselves is playing a role um, here pretty clearly. And there's, there's some others like this. This is also Heartline was, was from multiple farms. Obviously there's more variation. So. Yeah, there's just sort of a practical, not an answer, but um, a place to look. Cool. Um, <clears throat> morning low on questions and still have time. So anybody who's wanting to pose them, feel free. Um, Bill asks, is the goal still the inexpensive handheld meter when data correlation is sufficient? Uh, absolutely, that is um, one of the goals, <clears throat> I think. You know, some people may have seen that as our, our headline goal. I, I've called it the shiny object. Um, this concept that you can walk into the grocery store or the farmer's market and um, assess in real time which bag of carrots is better for you um, is part of the, is a, is a goal. <clears throat> There's a number of other things that are also goals. So, you know, we want the, the grower to be able to assess the plant while it's growing and understand how they can change their management <clears throat> to ensure that the levels when harvested are high. Um, we wanna provide 
uh, retailers or um, packagers or, or processors the ability to make decisions about which instrument, which crops they bring in. So still on the topic of, of you know, instruments that were being built, you know, I think for this whole process to work, we need to think about everyone, everyone in the food supply system. Um, and so <clears throat> the question is which meters cost how much and how good are they and um, how soon are we going to be able to build them? And I don't think I've got good answers or projections for that. Right now we do have a, a you know a good solid basically functioning instrument, but it is far from our end goal. Um, so uh, beautiful. This is the the look that you're going to get on the meter if you ordered one. So um, so I'm not sure if we've this says a, a crop, we can just say it's lettuce. Um, but so say here with this, is that lettuce? You just did that just now? <laughs> Brilliant. So Greg is Greg is testing lettuce with the current uh, bionutrient meter. And um, just this is the reading that just popped up on his screen. So the antioxidants level we predicted at, at 82, although there's a confidence bar there is somewhere in that range. The BRICS reading um, <clears throat> was at 50. The confidence range is, is worse there. We're not really sure exactly where it is in the in the range. And the polyphenols is at 89. And so um, that's basically what people who are who have bought the most recent generation of the bioenergy meter that'll be shipping likely next week will see on the phone screen once they've completed the assessment. So um, and then yeah, an average of, of 73, we'll say. Um, so Anyway, it's it's a, it, it is a significant accomplishment, I would say, to have gotten this far. And gratitude to everybody involved. Um, it's been an absolute team effort. And to do this open source, you know, everything's not patented, you know, not <laughs> locked up. Um, you know, I think it's been a, it's been a really successful um, proof of concept for our work. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And and one of the excited, you know, obviously this is still a. This model is still in development. Um, we'll be adding a lot of data to this model this year, so hopefully we can get it better. Ultimately, we're limited by the quality of the instrument and the limitations of the instrument and the noise and data and things like that. So it's, this model is never going to be perfect in its current state, but um, we're excited to have people actually run this in the field on samples and then send those samples in to, to help us validate or invalidate. Um, what we're trying to predict here. So you're, you know, you're still part of a development cycle. It's just we finally gotten to the point where we can give you something interesting in the field um, that, that we can all work on together. So. Yeah, great. Um, Bridget asks, are food manufacturers cooperating to gain this valuable information? If so, is there a pipeline for farmers to these brands to interact? Um, um, we have had conversations with a number of different companies. Um, the uh, only one we've had a, a, a real partnership with is actually called Pipeline Foods, and they're a grain company, and they were the ones that helped raise the money to do the oats and wheat work last year. Um, they aren't a manufacturer per se; they're sort of they work between the growers and and you know the General Millses or the Annies or whoever it is that's going to be buying those. Um, grains and sort of serves as a, as a distributor. And they were interested in, you know, if, if growers are being <clears throat> quote unquote regenerative or organic, which is most of their supply chain, is there a nutritional superiority or is it really effectively the same? Um, and that's really, the, that was the question that it got us started with oats and wheat. Um, I don't know, I, I don't think I could say that we've got any significant food, food manufacturers that are um, actively engaging. Uh, General Mills is part of the um, the Open Team project. Um, they are working on some of the software stuff. Uh, they have not been interested in funding anything as far as nutrient variation. Um, I would say it's a bit threatening at this point um, to a lot of the current uh, way that food manufacturers work. Um, but yeah, uh, conversations are conversations are 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 proceeding. Um, we are moving forward on, as I said earlier, beef this year, um, and that's an interesting dynamic where um, a lot of the growers that are producing grass-fed beef are producing it in some kind of a scale and have their own label and would love to be able to market on the label at the local grocery store, wherever it is, 
the nutritional superiority of the crop they're producing. So um, no amalgamators right now, but we're really trying to, to um, develop that pipeline um, and open to those who are interested. Any, any other points on that, Greg, or that cover the basics? Oh, I think that's right. I would, I would just add that um, actually um, General Mills did actually contribute a bunch of those wheat and oat samples and, and specifically a bunch of oats, uh, really diverse oats. Uh, they went out and found, you know, a combination of location, variety, and management to give us a really good, you know, 100 or 150 samples from really diverse areas, which is important work, you know, having, having that there. And so they've expressed a definite interest within their supply chain um, of, you know, of supporting people to do the right thing and a recognition that the definition of right thing um, is not easy to do in a centralized way. Um, so I, I, we definitely appreciated their, their support. Cool. So. <clears throat> uh, Martha asks, is the display software off the shelf or custom build or somewhere in between? Um, this, this, this is custom built. I yeah. think you're talking about the meter. The meter? Reading. Um, this, uh, the software itself, well, it's all, it's all custom built in the sense that we build the software that this is based on survey stack. Um, uh, this particular widget, this little, this particular display was built by Octavio, who also did a massive amount of this work, including the visualizations and a lot of the data. Um, I, so yeah, this is a custom widget. And then survey stack is a piece of software that's publicly available, but, but we did build. Hope that answers your question, Martha. Mostly, mostly custom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Isabel asks, have you found the data supports your teaching so far or have you made changes to your courses based on what you've found? Mm -hmm. hmm, good question. Um, I don't think we found anything yet that has caused me to change uh, what I present. Um, I would say that we have not interrogated the data sufficiently. Um, that's been one of our biggest problems is we've been, it's been everything we we can do to uh, keep the lights on, keep the money flowing, keep the samples coming in, get the data collected. Um, and even, you know, one of our struggles right now, or at least things that I'm, I'm focusing on um, is taking all this work that we've done and, and finding ways to publish it in peer reviewed journals. Um, you know, there's a lot of assumptions and a lot of, a lot of individual papers that would be in a formal scientific process, the way you'd present what we're doing. Um, the whole strategic way of looking at <clears throat> all these dynamics in relationship to each other, the decisions we made about this, the lab and how that runs. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of, of points there that, that properly would be published in, a, in peer reviewed journals um, if you wanna be getting legitimacy. So um, I'd like to think that as that's done with our work, I can speak with greater confidence, but it does certainly seem that the more, the management practices that we would correlate with biological system function are showing um, crops on the higher end of the scale. So um, I feel, I feel um, <clears throat> affirmed, at least with what we've got so far. But again, when you look at labels like organic or biodynamic, um, it matters so much how it's grown. And those labels don't necessarily, you know, I wouldn't say you have to have good biological management practices to have a, a, a organic certification or necessarily a, a biodynamic certification. So um, the, as far as management concerns, I think we're, we're, we're feeling, feeling affirmed. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I wouldn't, uh, I, again, the focus is on building a framework. Like I wouldn't take anything so far to the bank in terms of you know, but even just, I think just so much more work needs to go into identifying good um, measurements that we can be really confident, you know, deliver human, positive human health outcomes. Um, even things like antioxidants that have been measured for a long time, it's still, you know, how important is that? I don't know. Um, so hopefully this frame. Well, we're going to dig deeper into the complete, you know, um, metabolome. <laughs> yeah. Um, as, as I've been discussing with, you know, with, with beef recently as a, sort of our next crop we're taking on and looking at a more, a more comprehensive suite of 
health giving compounds. Um, I think it is, it sure does look from that data that we're looking at that um, the, you know, the rotational grazing, the, the managed multi-species um, pastures is correlating with much higher levels of human health beneficial compounds. And I think the presentation we got from uh, Pierre Riel last week was also very compelling with the work that he'd done in, in, in Europe um, on these things, how you raise the animals, what you feed them, correlates directly with the health beneficial compounds in the in the um, things you eat. So, yeah. Uh, Faith asks if this is iOS compatible, and the answer is no. This is an Android only function right now because of again the cost of effectively, you know, it's a hundred thousand dollars to make your meter Bluetooth able to, with a um, with an iPhone, and we just haven't had those resources. Is that a fair? Fair characterization, Greg. Yeah, this this um this dashboard is iOS compatible and works on, you know, most. So yeah. the dashboard's fine. You can go there. But yeah, in terms of the meter, um, it, no, it's still not. Um, uh, all I, I would say this: if you're a grower partner and you're filling out just data to submit to the lab, um, that's all iOS compatible now. So that's good. Everything, so if you're just everything except yeah. for the meter is iOS. Everything compatible. except for the meter. That's right. Yeah. 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 And uh, perhaps a follow up from Faith is the generation one model meter upgradable to the generation two meter? And the answer is yes. Um, we haven't sent that email out to those people who have the first generation meter, but we figure it'll be about 150 bucks. Um, you send it in, we'll update it and send it back to you. So that's, it is a, <clears throat> it is entirely plausible. And as soon as we ship out these ones that we've got ordered now, um, those people who have the old ones will get an email offering that opportunity. Um, okay, a couple questions from Matt. Um, looks like they're all part of the um, one question here. Um, what is the average time from harvest to lab, and have you attempted to track this to understand um, to understand degradation over time? I understand minerals to be consistent over time, but not sure about other nutrients being measured. Um, I can start with that and then you can follow it up, Greg. Um, <clears throat> it is true that things like copper and zinc and iron and potassium do not degrade. You know, if they're in the leaf of lettuce when it's picked, they're still going to be in the leaf of lettuce when it's dried up or rotten. Um, things like vitamin C and polyphenols will degrade over time. Those compounds do break down um, and there is a a speed of breakdown, which is not linear, um, depending on the inherent quality of the crop when harvested. Um, if it's low, the breakdown seems to happen faster. And if it's high, it happens slower. Um, this is another piece that's been well documented with um, Teak Origins work. Um, you know, part of the reason that they say that it looks like the whole food supply chain generally has crops that are more or less nutritious than Walmart is because Walmart's supply chain runs faster. They're basically buying crops of similar nutritional content to begin with, but it takes five days for them to get to the shelf at Walmart and, and nine days for them to get to the shelf um, at, at Whole Foods. Um, so um, yeah, but as far as the specific timing of, of um, from harvest to a, a sampling, um, you know, there's a, a big difference, A, in that when the citizen scientists are purchasing something off the shelf, we don't know how many days between uh, harvest and arrival of that shelf occurred. Um, but generally when they're harvested by the, by the grower partners, it's just a couple days between harvest and, and arrival at the lab. We, we do, do have a good idea about that. But. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add some things. Actually, Dan Travis was just laughing this morning that, uh, that Whole Foods actually does have lower <laughs> and I mean, here it is right here. Here's Whole Foods, 27 samples of lettuce. Here's not Whole Foods, 131 samples. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a difference. This is, and this is our quality index. So this is sort of representative across a variety of things. So we found similar results there. I didn't, um, I didn't see this one. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is why we want people trawling through this data because there's all kinds of stuff in here. Um, so I would say that, and then um, we did this last year, we struggled because of the pandemic. Um, 
uh, we, we, we struggled with slow ship times. It was, it was a real problem. Um, we excluded a lot of data, um, a lot of rotten lettuce. Um, um, we, we do, it's on the docket to include in our brief, and I'm sure Dan Travis, who's on the call when we, when he finishes the, the final report, which will do a lot of the summarization and stuff for you that you can read through, there will be an element in there about ship time. I believe what we've seen so far is not a huge change until a certain, you get to a certain point and it goes like this. Um, but but I, I think that that's what we found, but you'll see it when we get to the final report. Great. Well, um, we've successfully, how do they say it at uh, Car Talk? You've, you've successfully wasted another hour. <laughs> so, <laughs> except in this case, it's been an hour and a half. Um, I hope you all uh, have enjoyed the conversation and, um, and up the update. And it's a work in progress, but I feel like we're really this year um, at an inflection point where we've been doing proof of concept and putting this framework together that we think is aligned with our principles and intentions. And now it does feel like the support is, is coming in larger, um, more significant quantities. And, um, you know, I, you know I, I'm not sure if it'll be three months or six months or a year before we can sort of project what, when the next level of success we think will occur and what it'll look like. But it does feel like we're, we're at an, a, a very significant inflection point. So um, great to have gotten this far. Um, and, uh, that's all I've got. Do you have any any final words of uh, insight or commentary, wisdom, Greg? No. Thanks, everybody, for all the really great questions. That was fun. I wish we had more time. And I think we're going to, Dan Wright, walk through these things a little bit more after the report comes out. We'll have some more opportunities to, to just walk through data together. And hopefully people can bring smart or or, or whatever questions they want. Bring your questions, and we'll, and we'll interrogate them. And yeah, exactly. All right. Great. Well, thank you all. Thanks all.